Welcome to this conversation with Swami Chidananda on the topic of Sankhya and Modern Science. Swami Ji has done his M.Tech in Electrical Engineering from IIT Madras in 1982 uh, and he has spent many years in the Chinmaya Mission. So he has a very strong background of both our spiritual tradition as well as science. So I thought he is the, you know, one of the most appropriate persons to have this conversation of linking our ancient wisdom with our modern understanding of how the universe works. Uh, he also was a governing body member of the Krishnamurti Foundation in Varanasi. And uh, currently he is uh, running two spiritual organizations. Uh, one is called Fovai, Flame of Who Am I? And the second one is called Opa. And both of these organizations have the uh, primary objective of spreading the knowledge of Upanishads amongst the masses, especially <coughs> the younger generation. So with this uh, brief introduction, Swamiji, I would like to start uh, our conversation. Uh, as I mentioned, this conversation is about our uh, uh, connecting our ancient wisdom with our modern understanding of the world. Now, although there are many different branches of Indian philosophy, but as per my limited understanding, Sankhya is perhaps the closest uh, to science because it is connected to both the yoga tradition as well as the concept of Tantra which has you know, many interesting ideas uh, which science would be interested in. Uh, so, Swamiji, would you agree with this uh, basic thought that Sankhya is perhaps the, uh, you know, the best starting point to have a conversation in connection with science? I would think so. Sankhya is uh, that system of thought from which practically all other systems uh, keep drawing. Therefore, okay. it is regarded as... Um, uh, a wonderful source of may, may very many components of uh, philosophical thinking. So, Swamiji, uh, uh, when we talk of Sankhya or even in this, uh, in, in this concept of uh, Vedanta, the first thing that comes is this idea of Prakriti and Purusha. Correct. So, uh, uh, please can you give us a very brief idea about what is Prakriti and what is Purusha? And perhaps, are there any elements in science that we can try to connect with uh, uh, both of these concepts? Right. That is a question I would love to take up first. And uh, you perhaps read my mind. <laughs> uh, so, what is common to people like you and me is we have studied science. You, of course, are continuing to teach science and technology. And uh, we then, as we are growing up, uh, we get exposed to our own Indian schools of philosophical thought and with our science background, we are actually excited to see a lot of common uh, features, a lot of parallels. So in that light, if you are asking me what common stuff we find between Sankhya and uh, science, in particular as you expressed, the Purusha Prakriti uh, dichotomy or duality as found in Sankhya and things that we come across in science. Yes, actually, first of all, let's define, especially for the benefit of our audience uh, who may not know these two words clearly. In Sankhya philosophy, Purusha is the sentient principle, the principle having life. And by life is meant, above all, the ability to know, ability to see. There's a chair in the room and I am sitting. And if a cat moves across uh, the room, I know what is that that mood. Whereas the chair doesn't know. Right. So in a simple way, though everything is subject to more and more debate, that is a different issue. But basic definition is, that which knows, that is sentient, and then there is that which doesn't know. The sentient principle is Chetana elsewhere, and uh, the insentient principle, inert principle, is Jada elsewhere. In Sankhya, this Chetana Tattva is number one, called Purusha, we come to the point now, and the Jada Tattva, the insentient principle, is called Prakriti. And I just at this moment add uh, one more dimension. In Sankhya philosophy, 
or without delaying, uh, you know, a glimpse into where Sankhya differs from Vedanta and so on, I am uh, tempted to make this remark. In Sankhya philosophy, Prakriti is one, one whole stuff. But Purusha, the sentient principle is not one. It is countless Purushas. Whereas Adi Shankara's Advaita Vedanta, which uh, Adi Shankara did not found, he did not, he is not the founder, but he highlighted that interpretation of the Vedas and Upanishads. Ultimately, the Purusha is only one. The self in you, the self in me, self in a cat or a mouse, there is only one self. Now, now, coming to the second aspect of your question, having defined what is Purusha and what is Prakriti, the second part was, do I see uh, some commonalities between Sankhya and uh, science? In science, from our early, maybe elementary school classes, we were told everything in the universe is of two kinds, energy and matter. And then for some classes, we were told conservation of energy and then conservation of matter. And then at some point we were told the hidden truth is matter and energy can be interchanged also and all the rest is history. Now, at that time itself, either through this division of energy and matter or somewhere else in chemistry or somewhere we, uh, through the categorization, categorization of all the elements, the scientific approach consisted in appreciating the creation as made of two parts or three parts or ten parts. And long ago, thousands of years ago probably, in Sankhya philosophy, this was attempted. And in a way, the philosophy goes one step further. We have sentient, that is Purusha, and insentient, that is Prakriti. And that Prakriti is further divided into some parts which will come up as you raise more questions. Now, Swamiji, before getting into Purusha, let me ask you a question about Prakriti itself. Yeah. So, uh, uh, in the Sankhya philosophy, uh, when they talk of Prakriti, they list uh, its uh, 24 or 25 constituents. Right. Uh, which, uh, which can be called as the elements which make up these Prakriti. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, now, Swamiji, without getting into those uh, details, uh, as far as I know, those uh, elements are in some sense can be considered to be properties which can be observed. Okay. In a okay. Sense. Uh, but, uh, but it does not talk about the principles or the laws which governs these properties. Okay. For example, in science, we have things which we can observe. We can observe a table, we can observe a car, we can observe a chair. And there are these laws of Newton's or, or the laws of quantum mechanics which govern the motion of these objects which we can observe. Correct. So, Swamiji, similarly in Prakriti, uh, 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 do we also talk about these laws or, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, basic principles which govern the motion of these elements of Prakriti? This is an area where the Sankhya philosophy, to my understanding, is a little unclear. By and large, the Sankhya Darshana has the flavor of the laws being inbuilt into Prakriti. Okay. okay. Not through an outer agency. Okay. By and large. But here and there, there is a little flavor of say, an Ishwara Tattva. Right, right, right. Ishwara, the presiding principle. Right. You see, again, in the Vedanta, we clearly have an Ishwara principle. Yes. Jiva, Jagat and Ishwara. Yes. In Sankhya Darshana, by itself, Ishwara is not very clearly spelt out. And this is the right time for me to say, in Yoga, which is said to be a sequel to yes. Sankhya, in fact, uh, classically, Yoga and Sankhya are studied together. Uh, and some scholars even call Yoga of Patanjali nothing but Seshwara Sankhya. That is surplus Ishwara. Okay. If you take Sankhya and add Ishwara in very clear way, 
you know in an unclear way ishwara is present in uh, sankhya but not explicitly right. if you explicitly talk about god ishwara and add it to the sankhya darshana that becomes yoga so yoga equals seshwara sankhya or sankhya equals nirishwara yoga sankhya is yoga minus ishwara right. and yoga is sankhya plus ishwara but uh, now coming back to sankhya itself it is said that there is no need for an external agency the gunas which constitute prakriti have their own laws okay okay in a way that resembles modern science most scientists who do not believe in god in fact who do not believe in life consciousness apart from matter they would say there is no need for proposing you know a consciousness principle they would say that these matter and energy uh, you know the pair the couple they have their own dynamics right so, so uh, one, one sentence answer is prakriti has laws within it now swami ji coming to this idea of purusha and yeah. and you mentioned very nicely that uh, this difference between sankhya and vedanta uh, that sankhya talks about multiplicity of purusha Yeah. and in fact uh, patanjali calls ishwara as purusha vishesha purusha vishesha so that itself shows that sankhya is talking of uh, multiple uh, purushas whereas advaita <laughs> talks of a single purusha which is uh, ishwara also so is, uh, you know governing everything so now swami ji this is actually a very important question from the scientific perspective because uh, uh, you know currently in modern science as you know quantum mechanics is like an established uh, principle yeah and there was a lot of debate in science especially einstein was uh, you know very strongly against this you know randomness and uncertainty yeah. and everything yeah and there is this famous quote saying that god does not play dice right. Right. so he was always insistent that there is a inherent deterministic uh, theory Yeah. which can reproduce all these laws of uh, you know quantum mechanics correct now, now uh, although this debate is kind of settled in the scientific community people have discarded einstein's view and they accept uh, quantum mechanics yeah. and that is on the basis of something called bell's theorem i see there is this guy called bell who proposed mm-hmm. a theorem which was tested which kind of established that there is mm-hmm. uh, this randomness and uncertainty is an inherent part of our nature Okay. which cannot be uh, removed however swami ji the interesting point and the connecting link is that in order to say that bell's theorem has been uh, proven uh, we need to discard something called super determinism so oh. this super determinism again without getting into lot of details yeah but the idea is that when let's say you know two different people perform an experiment hmm. the assumption is that they are doing so independently So let's mm. say if I am performing an experiment in Bhopal and you are performing an experiment in Solan, we are mm. doing it independently on our own volition, mm. and that is kind of the idea of independent purushas. That you know, this oh. my purusha and your purusha are yeah. kind of independent, and we are deciding independently what to do and what not to do, what to measure, what not to measure. Correct. If we say that there is only one purusha, which mm. is kind of the governing conscious principle behind. all the sentient life yeah then this idea of independent action kind of goes away okay then there is a correlation between what i do and what you do between what i measure and what you measure yeah in which case uh, bell's theorem no longer holds mm-hmm. and is no longer we can no longer say that bell's theorem has been uh, you know proven and so uh, you know uncertainty and randomness is inherent So, so what what would you uh, say to this idea of super determinism that are the actions of two individuals or two human beings uh, independent or is there some causal correlation uh, between them? In the Indian darshanas, both these have been recognized. In the individuals having certain independence is regarded as a lower level. I am speaking as an Advaita Vedanta. Right, right, right. In the Advaita Vedanta. we do not literally dismiss the plurality we say plurality is a lower reality okay and uh, oneness is the highest truth okay therefore uh, whatever you said about those uh, individuals 
may be doing some research in Bhopal or Himachal Pradesh and so on. And uh, they ha ha having certain independence. Uh, that is one level of reality. In the Advaita Vedanta, there is this very popular example, a metaphor. The one sun in the sky gets reflected and appears to be number of suns in buckets of water. And because of various factors, the way the water is moving in one bucket and what happens to an image there and the way the water is shaking in another bucket and how the image over there looks bright or dark, steady or splitting, it changes. Right. So it may appear that these are all very unconnected. They have their own independence. Right. But the higher truth is they are reflections of the one sun in the sky. Okay, so we can we can sort of say that uh, uh, you know that this independence of will and action that appears is accepted from one level. Yeah, correct. But another deeper level, there is a yeah. unifying principle yeah. which governs all our uh, actions. Correct. Correct. However, Swamiji, that Ishvara or that yeah. uh, uh, you know unifying principle. Yeah. Uh, if I understand correctly, that is kind of beyond the laws of nature. Hmm. Right. So, 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 so the decisions taken by Ishwara about what to do, what not to do. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> what kind of laws govern that, or or is that totally uh, you know random or uncertain in nature? Right. Again, you see, that's where science shakes hands with philosophy. Uh, from philosophical point of view, uh, we have an interesting uh, uh, dimension here. Rather than talking of a super law, rather than talking of a law of all laws, in Advaita Vedanta, there is a quantum leap at the, uh, uh, the highest height of uh, uh, philosophy, uh, what is called as Ajatavada what is called as in reality the question is wrong oh. that is yes that is the question presently is does the individual have free will if yes that is one level of reality the individual has no free will god decides everything sitting above that is a higher level of reality and the highest level of reality is this whole business of conceiving individual and God as separate and the whole business of imagining that there are egos, there are selves, selves you know, is not tenable. There are no separate selves at all. Right. So if you see a particular verse in Saddarshanam by Sri Ramana Maharshi, he echoes the Upanishadic view. Uh, Ramana Maharshi says in uh, a one verse in his work called Saddarshanam that there is a long standing debate whether an individual has free will or God decides everything. If somebody goes to the root of this matter, one finds <coughs> that there is no individual at all. The ego, the self, is an illusion, it's a phantom figure. And when there is no illusion at all, uh, so no, no ego at all, no little self at all, the question becomes uh, meaningless. And uh, he gives a very humorous example. This was in 1940s when radio receivers were used to be huge things with you know vacuum tube based technology. And I believe two villagers were wondering, standing next to a radio receiver, they may be belonging to the government, placed in a park and so on, because very few people in a village or town could uh, have their own radio. And a song was coming. And villager one wonders, is the song uh, decided by the singer sitting inside this box? The other fellow says, no, no, he has no freedom to decide what song to sing. He's sitting there, you know, those days are not Rafi, uh, maybe not even KL Saigal, somebody in the 1940s. Uh, that singer has no freedom. There is something called station, and the station says, okay, sing next that song. 
<laughs> and then that fellow says, okay, and he sings. Now, the truth of the matter is, there is nobody sitting inside. An electronics engineer like you or me will come along and say, hey, guys, there is no it's only vacuum tubes and circuitry here. There is no so no ego. The ego is false. It is a quantum leap. It just takes us to a different level. Though it may sound evasive for people, you know, people want a... That's how Einstein protested against uh, uh, quantum mechanics. <laughs> this uncertainty was very evasive for him. Yes. You know? <laughs> now, Swamiji, there is this idea that connects, I think, all these ideas of Prakriti, Purusha and our science is this basic concept of energy. Because, uh -huh. uh, you know, whatever we consciously experience or whatever happens unconsciously or everything is kind of uh, interplay of energy in some sense. Or, mm -hmm. or uh, mm -hmm. for example, if you say that, you know, Shiva and Shakti are one and the same in yeah. some sense in, in Indian philosophy, uh, we say yeah. that, that Shiva is the conscious principle and Prakriti is the energy movement right. principle. But they are the same, which is the right. which is Brahman and all these differences, as you also mentioned, are just an illusion because of our ignorance and, and, and our mm -hmm. ego. So now, Swamiji, if we take this energy and if we focus mm -hmm. on that, there is a kind of a dichotomy between the kinds of energy in this sense. So, of course, we can divide energy into many different ways. We can talk yeah. of chemical energy, mechanical energy, yeah. electric energy, and many other kinds of energy. Correct. But if we talk about it from uh, uh, you know slightly more uh, you know fundamental sense, there mm -hmm. seems to be three kinds of energy to me at least. I may be wrong. Uh, uh, please, please, uh, please do correct me okay. if you. If you okay. So one form of energy is what is studied by science. So science mm -hmm. says energy and matter are interconvertible. So whatever we call mat matter is kind of energy in another form. Yeah. So now that form of energy is what we can measure or what we can mm -hmm. objectively observe using physical instruments is what right. science studies. Yeah. Another form of energy is what is called the mind or the buddhi or these inner subtle levels yeah. which are kind of very first person in nature that I can observe only my mind and my buddhi. I do not know what is going mm -hmm. on in your mind or your uh, you know subtle levels. So it is very subjective. Mm. The first thing is objective that both of us can see a car going on the road, which is a form of objective, yeah. physically measurable energy. But there is also this yeah. objective, you know, personal uh, energy, which is the form of mind. And the mm. other form of energy is what is called our consciousness, chitta, or any of these uh, terms you can use. Mm. So now, mm. my first question is that. Are these mind and these other subtle levels of energies, are they truly subjective or do you think they can also be observed by another person if that person is sufficiently advanced in the, in the yeah. field of yoga? Or, uh, I see in your question uh, two aspects. The one aspect that seemed to come out from your question is... Uh, whether this energy is really different from the energy we talk about physics. Yes. I don't know whether you meant it, but there seemed to be that flavor. Yes. Um, is that dividing line a very concrete one or can we erase that dividing line? In the light of whatever I have studied and reflected, to me it seems that dividing line can be erased. This is a subtle energy, sukshma, and uh, that is a grosser energy, uh, what we talk about in uh, uh, science. And uh, the psychic energy and the energy in the uh, field of physics uh, are interchangeable. And we do have examples of some uh, mystics who by thought itself are able to influence uh, yeah. phenomena outside. In these days, uh, you know, Swami Rama went to uh, United States towards the end, I think, of last century. Uh, he was able to, at will, increase the body temperature or bring it down. Yes. Instruments are connected. So by willing, he was able to increase or decrease. 
the body temperature and probably certain other parameters of the physical body. The things that were measurable with scientific instruments were influenced by thought. Yes. Were made to change by thought. So one aspect of your question, therefore, was uh, the relationship between the two kinds of energies, psychic energy and uh, energy of the physical universe. We do believe that there is a connection, but most of us are unable to build the bridge. For us, they are watertight compartments. And uh, the second aspect of your uh, question, psychic energy is regarded as an expression of the sentient uh, principle, Purusha. It is said that Prakriti by itself has uh, uh, no energy. But in the presence of Purusha, Prakriti gets the energy and Shiva Shakti you talked about. Yes. Yeah, Shiva and Shakti. Now, Shakti does everything. So we bow down to, bow down before Mother Parvati saying, uh, it is you who do everything. <laughs> Shiva alone cannot do anything at all. You know, uh, the first verse of Saundarya Lahari says, Shiva Shaktya Yukto Yadi Bhavati Shaktaha Prabhavitum. Shiva is able to do anything. Shiva can even make a single blade of grass move only if Shakti is with him. So Saundarya Lahari being in praise of Divine Mother puts her on top. Right. But the other way also it can be said, without Shiva, yeah. <laughs> Shakti would not have any ability. Therefore, like you already said in your question, they are finally looked at as one only. They are inseparable. Depending on what we are looking at, where our uh, attention is, we begin to appreciate that particular dimension. One very interesting point, Swamiji, you mentioned is that Prakriti itself does not have energy. It gets it from uh, Purusha. Would you okay. elaborate on that? Because because my understanding was that Prakriti is the storehouse of energy as well. It's something like this. Uh, Prakriti, which is constituted of Sattva, Rajas and Tamas, SRT, and this SRT are not apart from Prakriti. It's not that Prakriti is like a pot and uh, SRT are like a painting, color painted on the pot. Pot and the paint on the uh, pot are separate. Whereas here, there is no Prakriti other than the Gunas and there are no Gunas other than the Prakriti. They are one. Now, there comes an interesting scenario. Um, the laws that govern the movement of Prakriti are inherent in Prakriti. But what makes the movement possible is Purusha's sentiency only. Just as, yeah, it, that's how I understand Sankhya. Just as in Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa's uh, interesting example, though which he gave, he gave it in the context of appreciating God. You have a vessel with water and you have put some pieces of carrot and um, you know capsicum, etc. You are boiling it. Moment to switch off this oven, all of them become quiet. Yeah. The moment you switch on the oven, all of them start moving. Now, whether they move up and down in a circular fashion or in some random fashion, that is none of the business of the flame. Yeah. The flame just energizes. Right. They have their own laws. Right. There may be a set of laws about uh, how they move, and uh, the whole dynamics of it. So, Prakriti has its own laws, but what makes Prakriti come alive is Purusha. But the irony of it, uh, it is all is, though Purusha has energized Prakriti, Prakriti successfully binds the Purusha. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yes. Prakriti, so, I was re reviewing the matter to this morning. Guna, uh, means attribute, Sattva Rajas Tamas. In Sanskrit, the word Guna also means a rope. Guna has the meaning of uh, rope, rasi. 
okay. uh, Raju. Yeah. So it's a pun on the word. It's a rope that binds. It's an attribute. As you also mentioned that these different kinds of energies may look like uh, you know uh, strict compartments to us, but as we go deeper, they are no longer uh, you know strict compartments. They actually become interconvertible. So then, does it mean that? after a person becomes sufficiently advanced in this uh, process of yoga or or yeah. spirituality so can that person then uh, then observe the other person's subtle energies like the mind like they observe the other person's body so here too it is not possible for ordinary people but as you carefully worded your question for those people who have advanced in uh, yogic development it is possible there are numerous instances of various mahatmas reading the mind of a visitor in a jiffy and if i may quote one example uh, you may have heard of this man who died a uh, few months ago uh, ram das yes yes ram, yeah. he was professor richard alpert uh, he was a professor in harvard and because he and um, Leary, uh, another professor, they began experiments in the 1960s on psychedelic drugs. Okay. Harvard University, going by the policies that time, strictly warned them, and they continued. They were fired. Yeah, Richard Alpert and uh, Kim Tim Leary, Tim Leary, they were fired from Harvard University, but supported by some philanthropists, they continued their experiments in an independent uh, house. and then somebody said why are you struggling with all these scientific experiments go to india and to make the long story short this man richard alpert comes to india and he goes towards nainital where this neem karoli baba was living now uh, as relevant to the issue now um, as soon as he takes his rooms maybe sleeps one night and next morning goes for darshan of neem karoli baba baba looks at richard alpert and says so you are missing your mother he asks and alpert is uh, flabbergasted because this had never happened to him before it seems but in during this visit to india traveling from new delhi to this um, nainital Uh, that particular name has uh, kenchi kenchi is the name of the village near nainital on a bus or so imagine 1960s roads were not so good bus must have been quite you know something <laughs> we look at the sky and uh, the stars in the sky stirred something up in him and this intellectual was very badly missing his mother back in united states but he never said it to anybody he just came and some room was set up for him he slept next morning he goes baba ah, so you are missing your mother so like this there are numerous instances though critics would say such things could be coincidence also right right Very so amazing are the powers of so therefore the sankhya and all these philosophies though they are so ancient they have a bearing on human life for eternity they have not they are not just some you know fancy imagination of somebody sitting with a cup of tea or something in the balcony <laughs> kushal ji i appreciate and admire your initiatives god bless you in your work thank you so much swami ji for sparing your valuable time it was thank really you. a pleasure discussing all these uh, issues with you and i look forward to another opportunity in the near future let's hope so i do thank you.